Hello friends, thanks for joining me for today's Bible reading for December 5th, and I'm reading 2 Corinthians 5 through 9. Verse 1, for we know that if the earthly house of our tent is dissolved, we have a building from God, a house not made by hands, eternal, in the heavens. For most certainly in this we groan, longing to be clothed with our habitation, which is from heaven. If indeed we are clothed, we will not be found naked. For indeed we who are in this tent do groan, being burdened, not that we desire to be unclothed, but that we desire to be clothed, that what is mortal may be swallowed up by life. Now he who made us for this very thing is God, who also gave us, who also gave to us the down payment of the Spirit. Therefore we are always confident and know that while we are at home in the body, we are absent from the Lord, for we walk by faith and not by sight. We are courageous, I say, and are willing rather to be absent from the body and to be at home with the Lord. Therefore also we make it our aim, whether at home or absent, to be well-pleasing to him. For, must, for we must all be revealed before the judgment seat of Christ, that each one may receive the things in the body according to what he has done, whether good or bad. Knowing therefore the fear of the Lord, we persuade men, but we are revealed to God, and I hope that we are revealed also in your consciences. For we are not commending ourselves to you again, but speak as giving you occasion of boasting on our behalf, that you may have something to answer those who boast in appearance, but not in heart. See, he's defending himself again. Or at least saying he's not going to defend himself again against those people. He's saying, you can defend us now. Verse 13. For if we are beside ourselves, it is for God. Or if we are of sober mind, it is for you. For the love of Christ constrains us because we judge thus, that one died for all, therefore all died. He died for all, that those who live should no longer live to themselves, but to him who for their sakes died and rose again. Therefore we know no one after the flesh from now on. Even though we have known Christ after the flesh, yet now we know him so no more. Therefore if anyone is in Christ, he is a new creation. The old things have passed away. Behold, all things have become new. But all things are of God, who reconciled us to himself through Jesus Christ, and gave to us the ministry of reconciliation. Namely, that God was in Christ, reconciling the world to himself, not reckoning to them their trespass, and having committed to us the word of reconciliation. We are therefore ambassadors on behalf of Christ, as though God were entreating by us, we beg you on behalf of Christ, be reconciled to God. For him who knew no sin, he made to be sin on our behalf, so that in him we might become the righteousness of God. See, there's the gospel right there. He said, we're ambassadors on behalf of Christ, and this is our message. This is our ministry of reconciliation. Now that we've been reconciled, here's our message to everyone else. It says right here, we beg you on behalf of Christ, be reconciled to God. That's the one thing we need to know that we know that we know. That we've believed by faith. We've believed in our heart. Confessed with our mouth Jesus is Lord. That we've been born again. That we've received that gift of eternal life through Christ. 6.1 Working together we entreat also that you do not receive the grace of God in vain. For he says in, at an at an acceptable time, I listened to you. In a day of salvation, I helped you. Behold, now is the acceptable time. Behold, now is the day of salvation. We give no occasion of stumbling in anything that our service may not be blamed, but in everything commending ourselves as servants of God in great endurance, afflictions, hardships, distress, beatings, imprisonment, riots, labors, watchings, fastings, pureness, knowledge, perseverance, kindness in the Holy Spirit, in sincere love, in the word of truth, in the power of God, by the armor of righteousness on the right hand, 
and on the left, by glory and dishonor, by evil report and good report, as deceivers and yet true, as unknown and yet well known, as dying and behold, we live, as punished and not killed, as sorrowful yet always rejoicing, as poor yet making many rich, as having nothing and yet possessing all things. Now let me stop, give you two thoughts that came to me. I think it's interesting he said unknown yet known because I think that's so true of people who are well known in the body of Christ are totally unknown to the world. They could be famous in the in the church and unknown, you know, complete oblivion to the to the unbelievers, which allows someone to travel and move around without really being noticed that much, even though they're very well known. I always found that interesting. And secondly, this principle that I've mentioned before that in sorrow, in grieving, in heartbreak, I have learned that we can also have joy at the same exact time because those emotions are of the soul and the joy is of the spirit. They're two different things. And so here Paul pointed that out. He said, um, as sorrowful yet always rejoicing. You see that? In trial, rejoicing. Because God gives us joy, the Bible says the joy of the Lord is our strength. We can have that joy coming up out of our spirit, comforting us while we are going through a hard time, a disappointment, a hurt. It's just amazing. So should we feel guilty for grieving or being sorrowful? Not at all. Those are normal, valid emotions. Obviously, you don't want to let them get overwrought or out of control. But no, we, you know, we grieve loss. We we are hurt when someone hurts us or wrongs us, right? But God gives us joy as a strength in the middle of it. Verse 11. Our mouth is open to you, Corinthians. Our heart is enlarged. You are not restricted by us, but you are restricted by your own affections. Now in return, I speak as to my children. You also open your hearts. Don't be unequally yoked with unbelievers. For what fellowship do righteousness and iniquity have? Or what fellowship does light have with darkness? What agreement does Christ have with Belial? That's B-E-L-I-A-L. -L. Or what portion does a believer have with an unbeliever? What agreement does a temple of God have with idols? For you are a temple of the living God. Even as God said, I will dwell in them and I will walk in them. I will be their God and they will be my people. Therefore, come out from among them and be separate, says the Lord. Touch no unclean thing. I will receive you. I will be to you a father. You will be to me sons and daughters. I love that part, and daughters, says the Lord Almighty. How many daughters of the Lord out there have had him refer to you as my daughter? I have. It's beautiful. I love it. 7-1. Having therefore these promises, beloved, let's cleanse ourselves from all the defilement of flesh and spirit, perfecting holiness in the fear of God. Open your hearts to us. We wronged no one. We corrupted no one. We took advantage of no one. I say this not to condemn you, for I have said before that you are in our hearts to die together and live together. Great is my boldness of speech toward you. Great is my boasting on your behalf. I am filled with comfort. I overflow with joy in all our affliction. There it is again. I overflow with joy in all our affliction. For even when we had come into Macedonia, our flesh had no relief, but we were afflicted on every side. Fightings were outside, fears inside. Nevertheless, he who comforts the lonely, God, comforted us by the coming of Titus, and not by his coming only, but also by the comfort with which he was comforted in you, while he told us of your longing, your mourning, and your zeal for me, so that I rejoiced still more. Please excuse my scratchy voice, anyone who's still listening at this point. I'm doing my best here. We're getting over a little cred that we picked up from the grandbabies over the holiday. Verse 8. For though I grieved you with my letter, I do not regret it, though I did regret it, for I see that my letter made you grieve, though just for a while. I now rejoice, not that you were grieved, but that you were grieved to repentance. 
for you were grieved in a godly way, that you might suffer loss by us in nothing. For godly sorrow produces repentance to salvation, which brings no regret. But the sorrow of the world produces death. For behold, this same thing, that you were grieved in a godly way, what earnest care it worked in you, yes, what defense, indignation, fear, longing, zeal, and vengeance, in everything you demonstrated yourselves to be pure in this matter. See, this is where, oh boy, I don't know if I should have stopped on this thought because it's not easy to articulate, but let me try. So what I hear Paul saying is that when you have this, when he said you were grieved to repentance, but because it was godly sorrow, it produced this amazing fruit of what he was saying, indignation, longing, zeal, vengeance. Whereas he said, the sorrow of the world produces death. So, you know, I can only think of before I got saved and the way I thought of things and saw things when I was still in darkness. You know, there was, there's no solution for regret or sorrow. It's just destruction, right? The wage of sin is death. I mean, nothing good could be seen to come of it without understanding how God, you know, having God in the mix and understanding how he turns all things together for good. But here with this, when Paul corrected him, he's so glad that they they received his re rebuke. They said, wow, yeah, he's right. And they repented and they said, yeah, so means they, they changed. They were like, oh, yeah, that's right. We were wrong. We need to do something different. And in that, they were refired. They were revived. You know, they they started, you know, it, it, it brought renewed fellowship with Paul, with the other brother they're referring to, with each other. You know, once, once you've set things right, it's just so sweet with the Lord. And that's what purity and holiness is. Okay, so that's why he said, in everything you demonstrated yourselves to be pure in this matter. See, people think of holiness and purity as being so, you know, um, prudish and difficult. But really, that's where the freedom is, y'all. It's walking in line with the Lord and just freedom and purity and honesty and truth and just, you know, it's true freedom. That's the only way I know how to describe it. So so Paul's literally rejoicing over that, that yes, you got what I was saying, you repented, and now the light is shining again, right? In many ways. So he said, um, so although I wrote to you, I wrote not for his cause that did the wrong, nor his cause that suffered the wrong. In other words, he's I wasn't trying to condemn someone or defend someone. I'm trying to get things going in the right direction. So he said, I didn't write it for uh, for his cause that did the wrong, nor his cause that suffered the wrong, but that your earnest care for us might be revealed in you in the sight of God. Therefore we have been comforted. In our comfort we rejoice the more exceedingly for the joy of Titus, because his spirit has been refreshed by you all. For if in anything I have boasted to him on your behalf, I was not disappointed. But as we spoke all things to you in truth, so our glorying also, which I made before Titus, was found to be true. So he probably said, just go. Trust me. They're going to understand. Things will be made right. And they were. So he's God about that. His affliction is more abundantly, his affection is more abundantly toward you while he remembers all of your obedience, how with fear and trembling you received him. I rejoice that in everything I am confident concerning you. So really he's commending their humility. 8.1. Moreover, brothers, we make known to you the grace of God which has been given in the assemblies of Macedonia, how in much proof of affliction the abundance of their joy, there it is again, much proof of affliction, the abundance of their joy, and their deep poverty abounded to the riches of their generosity. For according to their power, I testify, yes, and beyond their power, they gave of their own accord, begging us with much entreaty to receive this grace and the fellowship and the service to the saints. This was not as we had expected, but first they gave their own selves to the Lord and to us through the will of God. So we urge Titus that as he had made a beginning before, and this is talking about he had begun to get together a gift. So as he had made a beginning before, so he would also complete in you this grace. 
But as you abound in everything, in faith, utterance, knowledge, all earnestness, and in your love to us, see that you also abound in this grace. I speak not by way of commandment, but by proving through the earnestness of others the sincerity also of your love. For you know that grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, that though he was rich, yet for your sakes he became poor, that you through his poverty might become rich. I give a judgment in this, for this is expedient for you who were the first to start a year ago, not only to do, but also be willing. But now complete the doing also, that as there was the readiness to be willing, there may be the completion also out of your ability. That was a lot of words to say, finish up what you started. <laughs> Verse 12. For if the readiness is there, it is acceptable according to what you have, not according to what you don't have. For this is not that. So he's saying, whatever you have is fine. You don't have to wait until you have so much and you've impoverished your own selves. See, because listen to what he says. Verse 13. For this is not that others may be eased and you distressed, but for equality. Your abundance at this present time supplies their lack, that their abundance may also become a supply for your lack that there may be equality. As it is written, he who gathered much had nothing left over, and he who gathered little had no lack. But thanks be to God, who puts the same earnest care for you into the hearts of Titus. For he indeed accepted our exhortation, but being himself very earnest, he went out to you of his own accord. We have sent together with him the brother whose praise in the good news is known throughout all the assemblies. It doesn't say who that was. Not only so, but he was also appointed by the assemblies to travel with us in this grace, which is served by us to the glory of the Lord himself and to show our readiness. We are avoiding this, that any man should blame us concerning this abundance which is administered by us. Having regard for honorable things, not only in the sight of the Lord, but also in the sight of men. So he's saying, I think he's saying, he's trying to, Handle the giving and distribution of these gifts in a way that's honorable so that someone won't be able to find blame in them. And he seems to work very hard at doing that because people had accused them falsely. And, you know, it seems like Paul's heart is just so people won't be turned off to the gospel. Whatever he can do to save some and combat these lies the enemy keeps throwing up. Verse 21, having regard for honorable things, not only in the sight of the Lord, but also in the sight of men, we have sent with them our brother, whom we have many times proved earnest in many things, but now much more earnest by reason of the great confidence he has in you. As for Titus, he is my partner and fellow worker for you. As for our brothers, they are the apostles of the assemblies, the glory of Christ, the apostles of the assemblies, the glory of Christ. So, they were sent from the assemblies. <laughs> Therefore show the proof of your love to them before the assemblies and of our boasting on your behalf. 9-1, last chapter. It is indeed unnecessary for me to write to you concerning the service to the saints, for I know your readiness, of which I boast on your behalf to those in Macedonia, that Achaia has been prepared for the past year. Your zeal has stirred up very many of them, but I have sent the brothers that are boasting on your behalf may not be in vain in this respect, that just as I said, you may be prepared, lest by any means, if anyone from Macedonia comes there with me and finds you unprepared. So he's sending people ahead of him to get this gift ready. We, to say nothing of you, would be disappointed in this confident boasting. I thought it necessary, therefore, to entreat the brothers that they would go before to you and arrange ahead of time the generous gift that you promised before, that the same might be ready as a matter of generosity and not of greediness. Remember this, he who sows sparingly will reap sparingly. He who sows bountifully will also reap bountifully. Let each man give according as he has determined in his heart, not grudgingly or under compulsion, for God loves a cheerful giver. And God is able to make all grace abound to you that always, no, that you always having all sufficiency in everything. How about that? Let me read this whole verse again. And God is able to make all grace abound to you. That's you and me. That you always having all sufficiency in everything may abound to every good work. 
as it is written, he is scattered abroad, he is given to the poor, his righteousness remains forever. Now may he who supplies seed to the sower and bread for food, supply and multiply your seed for sowing, and increase the fruit of your righteousness, you being enriched in everything to all generosity, which produces thanksgiving to God through us. For this service of giving that you perform not only makes up for your lack among the saints, but abounds also through much giving of thanks to God, seeing that through the proof given by this service they glorify God for their the obedience of your confession to the good news of Christ, and for the generosity of your contribution to them and to all, while they themselves also, with supplication on your behalf, yearn for you by reason of the exceeding grace of God in you. Now thanks be to God for his unspeakable gift. Praise God. That's beautiful. That's the end of today's reading, Second Corinthians 5-9. through Thank you for joining me. God bless you. Till next time.